like a stir. We ready for her to go live? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're good. Uh, welcome to the uh, NDTC's Legislative and Policy Committee uh, meeting for Friday, November 12, 2021. I'm, my name is David Meyer. I'm the chair of the committee. And um, I'd like to note that we are beginning this meeting at uh, 8, is that 33? I can't see that anymore. 35. 8.35. 8.35, yep. A.M. Um, we are back to normal meetings with a few modifications. We're continuing our safety protocols due to the surge of Delta variant. This meeting is being live streamed on YouTube for the public and the staff. This morning we have um, a quorum of commissioners participating. Um, in, in, in the present, I mean, in, in Carnet, I should say. Yes, it's perfect, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so let's begin. We The first item is that we have a summary of our last meeting, which was on October 7. Uh, are there any corrections or additions or changes to that summary? Seeing none, we will accept them and move on. Um, this morning we have uh, updates for both our state and federal, uh, from our uh, state and federal uh, legislative liaisons. First, we're gonna hear from uh, Amy Perrin Seibert, who is going to give us an update on the General Assembly. Amy, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having me and Alex here. Um, and so we will give a brief update, obviously, since the last time we met, we had our um, elections, which is what we were sort of waiting for. And so, um, as everybody knows, the, um, the statewide elections went to um, the Republicans. So we have uh, Governor-elect Youngkin, um, Lieutenant Governor-elect Sears, and Attorney General-elect Mieres will be um, all being sworn in on um, January 15th. And so we have um, a full shift in the administration from Democrat to Republican, um, which will be obviously a big change for, for us and for, for everybody else, just from um, a standpoint of staffing and new secretaries, um, et cetera. And so um, that process is beginning um, and, uh, and the transition is happening. And I will let Alex talk about that in a second. I'll just say to the General Assembly, obviously House of Delegates had their elections as well. Um, and as of right now, the seats are 52 Republicans and um, 49, I'm sorry, 48 Democrats. And so the, the power has shifted there from, um, from Democrat to Republican as well. Um, there are two seats that um, could go to recount. They're both um, below 1%, if that's right, Alex, right? I think those two seats, Muggler and Askew, are within the recount range. And so the, I believe they probably will do a recount on those two seats, but they still have to be certified um, and go forward before that recount can happen. So everybody is proceeding at this point, um, like the Republicans are, are in power. Um, this weekend, both the House and the Republicans are gonna be meeting in their caucuses to elect their leaders, um, the minority leaders for the Democrats, and obviously the majority um, Speaker of the House included for the House Republicans. Um, and so from there, I know I think everybody's really anxious to know who all the committee chairs will be and the committee membership, um, but that will happen um, after the, the leadership is elected. So, um, you know, they have to get the speaker in place, a majority leader, caucus chair, et cetera, um, and then they'll start figuring out the committees. Um, they really don't have to tell us until January who the committee chairs are. Um, we are all hopeful that we will find out earlier than that. Um, I think everybody will wanna get started and, and, and get um, into place. Um, I do know that uh, you know the, the prospective speaker, who's Todd Gilbert, who is the majority leader under Kirk, Speaker Kirk Cox, I think is very sort of um, set on moving ahead. I would assume quickly, correct, Alex, and, and, and sort of getting everything into place. Um, you know, the good news, obviously, is he was in leadership for quite some time before the Democrats took over. So I think that it'll be a smooth transition from a from a committee standpoint and operation standpoint. Um, but they do still need like a new house clerk as well, which will be a big deal because that obviously is committee operations and, and committee staff. And so there will be a lot of changes. I think this is really the first time in my career where I can remember us having a flip in the House of Delegates as well as a flip um, in the administrations at the same time. So that's a lot of um, a lot of staffing changes and a lot of new people. In addition, there are 17 new delegates that were elected, so um, 17 total around the state, uh, so that we had a lot of open seats as well as the seats that flipped from Democrat to Republican. So 17 new delegates um, is again a large number. So again, that's a pretty that's a pretty big um, amount of turnover that we've got. 
Um, with that, do you guys have any questions about that part? I'll have Alex talk a little bit about the transition process for the uh, on the um, in the executive branch because I think that's probably important for us to know sort of what that looks like and what we're trying to work on for you too. Any questions? I don't believe so. Go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex to talk about the transition. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Alex Thorpe. Um, we are engaged with the uh, governor-elect uh, transition team. Um, I'm sure as you've read in the in the newspapers, they uh, did announce a transition steering committee and uh, transition co-chairs. Senator Steve Newman uh, and Kay Cole James are the co-chairs. And then uh, Governor-elect Youngkin will be advised by uh, a handful of honorary chairs, uh, including I think the last three or four Republican governors and also Governor uh, Wilder. So um, that is kind of the early initial framework. Um, as you all know from your own experience, a lot of this work is uh, staff driven and those uh, personnel decisions, I think for the most part have not been made yet. Um, there's always this, uh, there's always this kind of gray area as people who worked on the campaign either stay on board or start to, to fade away and they get a more permanent um, personnel structure in place. Uh, once that happens, and, and we expect that to happen in the coming weeks, um, they'll start probably making some uh, some decisions about uh, higher level personnel for the cabinet. Um, Governor elect Yunkin said during the campaign that there would be certain positions that he would prioritize filling as soon as possible. Uh, Secretary of Education, state superintendent, he promised to fill before uh, December 1st. Uh, he hasn't made any comments about transportation secretary, um, so we will uh, just wait and see when that happens. My um, my speculation is that we we likely won't see any secretary uh, proposed nominations until after Thanksgiving, with the exception of maybe the the secretary of education. Um, I think that the combination of of them just kind of being a little bit slow out of the gate to get a transition team up and running. Um, and then wanting to obviously make sure they, they get everything right and check the boxes. Um, I think maybe in early to mid-December, we'll start really seeing some movement um, and have some insight into how that might affect uh, the issues we care about. And, and, and one more piece to add there, just for, I'm sure everybody did see as well, but um, you know, Secretary Lane, who was, as you know, Secretary of Transportation during the McAuliffe administration, and really helped um, you know, lead quite a lot of the um, transformation that we have seen in the both transportation and transit and rail um, is also one of the advisors. So I think that's great. So no, he was Trans Secretary of Transportation and then Secretary of Finance under um, Ralph Northam. And so he's got quite a bit of experience with transportation and transportation funding. So I, I really take that as a good positive um, for having him there. I think he'll be a, a good advisor and I think that he will be um, really helpful in you know, helping guide um, the Yunkin transition on, on transportation issues. So I, I thought that was a really positive, positive sign um, for, for, uh, for the sort of, you know, stay the course kind of um, thought on the transportation uh, situation, which is what we're sort of looking for here. So just wanted to make sure we mentioned that too. So, okay, I think that's it from Virginia. Yeah, um, okay, yes, so, in a nutshell, what do we think Governor elect Duncan thinks about transportation? <laughs> well, um, to be honest with you, I mean, I think, and, and Alex and I have had extended conversations about this together. I think, um, you know, it, it really wasn't uh, a, a big part of his campaign. Um, right. uh, so, which I think, you know, in a way can be a good thing. Um, I sort of think that we, we we sort of see it as a positive where it's not something like, you know, if you looked at the House Republicans, I sent an article to Kate, I think last week, the House Republican caucus talked about their priorities and things that they were looking at either rolling back or changing. Um, transportation was not on that list. Um, it has not been high on the um, on the Yunkin transition team list either as something to sort of tackle as as big issues. I know the gas tax was a big piece, obviously, of his um, of his campaign. And that's something we're all keeping a close eye on. I know that a lot of people in the business community, as well as road builders, and a, a lot of other allies and folks are also keeping an eye on that part. And, you know, we're sort of hopeful 
that once you really get into that, that they'll see how hard that is to kind of unravel and, and deal with. I think it's probably going to be way too much for anybody to take a bite at during 2022. Um, and so I, you know, we're, we're sort of, but again, keeping a close eye on it. I think, I think that because governor elect Youngkin lives in Northern Virginia, I think he understands sort of the issues of transportation and congestion um, and multimodal transportation. I think, you know, working in DC in that area will help with that too. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we're not hearing a lot of moves and asking for changes or, you know, a big adjustments in, in how we've been funding both transportation, transit or rail. So, I, you know, I, I like to think of that as a positive. Um, and I think it'll be incumbent upon us to educate, you know, him and his team um, and whoever they choose as secretary about sort of all the good work that's been going on. One of the things I think that also is really positive, you know, the Joint Legislative um, Audit and Review Commission came out with their transportation study on Monday. Um, and it was a really good study. Um, they did a really nice job. And it really, it sort of, I think, really um, uh, lend a lot of positivity to the way the transportation funding structure looks and how our system is going. I think it, it really showed that we made some tough changes back, you know, a couple years ago that have really paid off. Um, and one of the reasons that Virginia is doing so much better in our transportation funding um, is because of all those changes that we made. And JLOC really, I think, um, put a good eye on that. They also did a really nice job of kind of showing how the gas tax and all the pieces um, play together. You know, uh, we, we know how complicated it is, but I think it was a helpful document. Um, I, I think that we will be happy to share with the transition team too. So I do think that's a positive piece for both the House Republican Caucus as well as, um, as, well as the transition team. So we can use that, I think, to just to help educate folks. GLARC is a, is a very well-respected organization. And I think it was really a positive that we came out with such a good report on Monday. So. Um, you know, Alex said the same thing. So I think it's, 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 it's a good thing for us. So that's, that's sort of, I think where we are. So I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. Thank yeah. Thank so, so I had the opportunity um, to hear both of the gubernatorial candidates spoke at the Virginia Transit Association meeting um, just earlier in, in um, October or September. And um, the message from Youngkin in that opportunity was all about performance-based decision-making. Well, one of the things that the Commonwealth has been doing and in particular in the public transit space and all the stuff that DRBT is doing, is all performance-based allocation of funding. So there's a good story. And I think that's a part of this is saying, there's really nothing to see here. The things that you want to see have done in terms of the way that transportation funding is allocated, it's already happening. So I think that that's that combination of story of successes and also that there's performance-based allocation of funding, I think will be very good. Um, and we're just, you know, again, we can talk strategy in a little bit, um, but I think there's some, um, I think there's some ways to weave into that message um, in a strong way. So, if I might, Mr. Chair, first, uh, I would request can we get a copy of the JLX. We will, and yeah, Amy, can I know it just. Um, yeah. Second of all, what specifically was in the platform about the gas tax? Which gas tax? How much? He, he um, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. You want to get the basically the uh, governor elect said he wanted to suspend the increase in the gas tax on day one, which is not within his power. It has to go through the General Assembly, both houses. So we'll see if that happens. But let's take that at face value. Um, what, what are we really talking about in terms of reduction in revenue relevant to NBTC? And then what could we not do? as a result of that action. I think these are things which we're going to need to have, at least in our hip pockets. So that sure. uh, if that, that issue, and it, as a major high-level campaign promise, you have to assume that there'll be actions taken to implement it. So if so, what does it mean in dollars and cents, and more particularly, what does it mean in terms of projects and public service of the transportation system? So the gas tax... Um, rolling back is specifically related to the Commonwealth Transportation Fund. It is not related to the funding that our localities use for their WMATA payment, nor does it re reflect upon the VRE and the WMATA dedicated funding. So just first of all, the Northern Virginia Regional Gas Tax is not a part of this conversation. My understanding, and I will confirm the numbers, is that the of the total transportation trust, trust fund as it was re figured out in the omnibus bill, somewhere between 23 and 25% of that overall pot is from gas tax. So what I would need to find out is then what part of that would be repealed and then what part of that 
would be reflected upon. Because again, that is highway and transit, not just transit. So it's a, it's not necessarily, it's not a good news story, but it's not, it, it, it's a, it's a slice of a slice. So I need to find out except when you talk about rolling back, what is literally that dollar value? And then when you look at the allocation to Northern Virginia for transit and for highways, I'd have to find that. Okay. Well, so that would be helpful. Yep, absolutely. I'm trying to really figure out what's the real world. Absolutely. Uh, Things. Were there any other specific campaign promises that you were aware of in the platform or otherwise made? That is the only one that I've heard. Others? Uh, nothing related to transportation. No. No. Okay. So that's it. Yeah. Any, any information? Data? Absolutely. No, no. I was very relieved to hear that it wasn't about our regional gas tax. So that was for me, it was because that was. I was very much focused on our regional gas tax for a little bit. So now knowing that that's not what they're talking about, we will get that answer for you. Okay. Absolutely. It's possible that once the reality of the proposals that were bantered around the campaign are put down on paper, that there'll be some symbolic um, adjustment rate or some, some sacrificial program, but I doubt. My personal view is that once the reality sets in, they'll realize that this is um, possibly something they can't can't really do or tolerate politically in terms of ending, right. ending certain projects. Right. I one thing I don't want to do is try to predict the future because every time I feel unusual. I know. So, I know. <laughs> no. You're, 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 I want to start with facts. What, the, what is the promise? Absolutely. How much does it mean? What is the real world impact? Right. And as other issues like that come up, I'm sure the same request will be there. And absolutely. You guys have been great on that. Absolutely. So, you know, your, your, your questions are good. We will absolutely run that. So we do also have the federal. I know we're going to dive into strategy, right. but I want to get, if you have been. Let them have the opportunity to dive into the federal. Just because uh, I do have one one question about Longbridge, and we spent the last three years working on that. Do you see any any change that could possibly uh, affect the plans for Long the Longbridge project? I, I mean, I, I do not. I, I certainly hope not. I mean, I think um, you know. I think one of the things that's helpful too with with this um, the the new governor and his staff who are sort of you know. I'll, we'll call them outsiders because they're not sort of insider Virginia folks is that, you know, they, they do have a big picture view, I think. And so, you know, understand that Longbridge isn't just about Virginia. I think Longbridge is about also open up the entire Eastern seaboard, which I think is really helpful. So I do think that, you know, when you, when you, when you talk about it in those terms too, I think it'll be, um, I, I just can't imagine them wanting to stop that project. I mean, I just, it, it seems it's so, it's going to be so transformative for Virginia and it's going to be transformative for the country. I mean, those are two things I think alone, um, make it something that will be, you know, that they will be proud to continue. I mean, I, I just, I have a really hard time with thinking that that's something that, that anybody would want to stop. And we're, and we're pretty far along too. I mean, we've got the we're working on the federal funding, you know, we've got we're working on the bonding now. I mean, like there's the, the forward momentum is there and, and the impact of changing that would be, would be really dramatic. And, and I can't really see any benefit to doing that truthfully. Okay. All right. Any other questions of uh, Amy? Or Alex. Okay. Federal. All right. Well, we do have Bennett um, Resnick. And as I had mentioned to many of you at our commission meeting the other night, um, VRE has a very capable team of federal legislative folks. And they said we can use them a little bit. So I am. <laughs> so well, thank, thank you, Bennett. So as you know, the infrastructure investment in the Jobs Act passed last week. And the signing of that at the law is going to be on Monday. We had a, a bit of a, of a discussion at the BAFTA conference in Orlando uh, with Chairman DeFazio and um, Kentucky Administrator Fernandez and Acting Administrator Lee Close about implementation of that, which I'll get to in a moment. But uh, big picture, um, $1.2 trillion, $550 billion of that is new uh, federal funding. $91.2 billion of that is directed to FTA, which is about a little over $40 billion above what we had in the FAST Act authorization. Um, with an additional 15.75 billion that is in the form of supplemental appropriations. So we do that every every year in the appropriations bill for FTA. Um, the projection of FTA transit formula funds, if we're using 2019 NTD data, um, 
the money going to Virginia over the five year period is a little over $1.2 billion. The challenge that we have now is um, we're currently under a continuing resolution of government funding, which ends December 3rd. We are likely to see another continuing resolution. Um, if the obligation limits uh, continue to be set by uh, at those 21 levels, we're not going to see or, or realize the increases in the Highway Trust Fund Authority that this new bill provides. And so uh, much of the increases for highways and transit are not going to be seen until we review that's appropriation with new obligation authority. Um, the Highway and Trust Fund Authority for highways, we, we would see a 19% increase in 22 levels and for mass transit, 24% increase. Um, and so that won't happen until we, we pass appropriations. Um, the implementation is, is going to be very, uh, very interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, we've, we've heard from the Department of Transportation that they're looking to put together a website that actually walks through you know, what's in the bill for, for DOT and how are they going to be executing um, this massive increase in funding and, and um, standing up these new, uh, new programs. And so as a result of um, the passage of the bill, there are these, a number of these working groups um, at DOT within the modal agencies um, to discuss how best to implement uh, the, the, the new law. Um, there are a number of new rules and guidance that will also result from the, from the bill, and so we're monitoring those closely. Um, uh, same thing with the new programs. There are a number of new programs at FTA and at FRA, um, uh, joint programs within the administration. They'll have to be stood up and, and could take a number of, uh, number of months to get done. At the same time, we have ongoing issues with the Budget Reconciliation Bill, known as the Build Back Better Act. Um, uh, we foresee that taking some time to actually complete. The Senate's going to be um, uh, making a number of amendments uh, to that bill, uh, and it will go back to the House. So we'll uh, we probably won't see that. My guess is probably just before the end of the end of the year, we may see passage of that. Um, but there's a number of complications, as you can imagine, uh, with the thin majorities in the House and Senate. At the same time, we have debt limit uh, to deal with and, uh, and appropriation. So it's going to be a very busy uh, time before the, uh, the end of the year. Any, any questions? Mm -hmm. You said $1.2 billion for transit? Uh, $1.2 billion, right, for, from the transit yeah. formula funds for, for Virginia over, <laughs> over, over the five years. Could you talk just a little bit more? I had forgotten the folks focus on the need to appropriate the funds. Right. Is this just another place where the, you know, the divisions in the Congress is going to show up and they're, you know, Republicans who will just like not appropriate anything no matter what? Uh, yeah. So the, you know, a lot of the benefits that from the infrastructure bill will need to be through the supplemental appropriations. So they've set the authorized levels. Mm -hmm. They just have to appropriate to the authorized levels. It's so sick, but they might not do that. But they might not, correct. So it is an annual advocacy campaign to make sure that, that they do uh, get the authorized levels. And then most likely when it gets to the appropriation, you can show this is going to go to this project, this project, so then everybody knows whose ox is going to get bored, so to speak, right. if they don't pass it, right? So right. that might make it easier. Exactly, right. Wow. And, and, it, and looking at just historically at the FAST Act, um, uh, the past several years for a number of programs, including the bus, uh, the bus program, they've, um, they've gone way over uh, authorized levels. Mm -hmm. The low note program, for example, is authorized at 55 million a year in the FAST Act, and it's been uh, 180 million or so uh, appropriated. I, I don't think we're going to see that in implementation of the infrastructure bill, but I think you know, hopefully we do meet the authorized levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Mr. Trevor, I could even just thinking about what how we have going on here in Northern Virginia. Um, and the federal transit program, the formula programs, which are out of the highway trust fund, those will 99.9% .9 of the time will meet the levels because it's coming from an existing trust fund. Those are the formula funds that VRE, WMATA, OmniRide, MTA, they get their capital programs. They have some ability to use preventive maintenance, but they are primarily capital. That's the other thing to remember. The federal program is a capital program. These other programs above and beyond are the competitive Right. And so those are the ones when I've been talking to various jurisdictions, they may be interested in looking into. Right. Um, and so Bennett's been very helpful in sort of unpacking what that means, what requirements they be. We're going to still wait and see. 
But those are the programs when he talks about the low no, that's the low and no emission bus and bus facility program. It's called low no, that's just the, you know, the jargon. That could be a program if the localities wanted to apply, it'd be federal. It has all the federal dynamics associated with that. And that's what we're trying to understand what those are. But that there's some planning grant program. There's other things that could find their way to be, as he said, subject to an annual appropriation. So they may be as big as promised, or they may be a little bit smaller. Because they are competitive projects, those seem to have fared well for appropriations in the past. Because while they are not earmarked, they still have a jurisdictional benefit, right? Because they are actually discretionary programs. So we're obviously, I mean, the bill's like, what, 2,000 pages. We're all just trying to un unwrap it all. But one of the things, so we're watching both the money that WMATA gets, obviously, in VRE, um, as well as what opportunities may exist. And I know you were asking about what opportunities may exist that our localities would be interested in playing in the federal space. Lots of strings attached, but there is a federal space. Mm -hmm. and if I can just add to that. So the, the reason why we've seen a large increase in the discretionary programs, as, as was said, is we've had, um, we, we've not had congressional direct spending or earmarks over the last several years. And so one way to direct money to the districts is by the discretionary grant program. Um, that said, there, there was the earmark process this year, uh, although uh, it was not included in um, Congressman DeFazio had put in a provision in the reconciliation bill that would have had $6 billion for local transportation projects. That's been stripped out um, for a number of reasons, but uh, I don't know what DeFazio's plan is to get those back in. Uh, the only way to do that is maybe attach it to, uh, well, attach it to any legislative vehicle. Um, the appropriations bills haven't passed yet, so it's possible that your marks you know, get to ride there as well. Um, but as of right now, in the reconciliation bill, the six billion dollar provision for local transportation projects is, is no longer included. Um, and so we do lean a bit more on the discretionary grant programs to make up for that. So, what I'm hearing actually, both levels is that, um, sort of our study that the regular funding is kind of not threatened, and sometimes it has been in the past, it's really are we going to make progress? And that's what's more in a question mark with, with on both sides. Is that a fair? I mean, at the federal level, the formula funding is going to be providing increases to WMATA, VRE. No matter what. No matter what. Yeah. Right. I mean, right. that is huge. It's huge for yeah. public transit in general. And by the way, VDOT is also going to see significant increases in their budget as well from the Federal Highway Administration. The other thing we've not really talked about, and although it's 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 tangential to VRE, is the um, the increases in passenger rail are like huge. I mean, I, what are they like a eightfold over current levels? And that's Northeast Corridor. That's your Amtrak. Most of it's Northeast Corridor. I've only looked a little bit of it, seeing some of the graphs on that just this past couple of days. Yeah, it's about uh, sixty-six billion to Amtrak. It's still good news. No, this is it, it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, although I don't know if they're there may be more subject to appropriation challenges than um, the highway trust fund stuff, but yeah. So there's again, everybody's sort of unpacking it. Um, and as you'll see, we talked about our federal legislative program, is there are some incredible opportunities, and part of it's being able to leverage those, right? And finding it in a space that if the localities wish to be leveraging, is arguably best in the best place to do so. Right. And on the rail side, there are a number of new programs, new programs for rolling stock procurement, uh, uh, F grade highway uh, crossings. Uh, so a number of new programs being set up there as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm used to sometimes having existential threats to whatever. <laughs> that, that, that I'm not hearing that, which is making me just relax a lot more. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is a very surreal, quite surreal. I, I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, I just we we had the opportunity to spend the last five days with public transit professionals from around the country, and I think everybody's like. I think probably the biggest challenge is not necessarily what you see in terms of the money. It's the workforce development. How quickly can we get it out? How can we show successes? Um, especially as we talk about things that are annual appropriated, how can you show in the next eighteen months successes so that there's no threat in the future appropriation. So it's more about, are we ready? Can we do it as an industry nationwide? But I think everybody's pinching themselves by the dollar values because they just are, blow your mind. 
And that, that, that was a big discussion of we have this massive increase in funding and yet we have these supply chain issues. And so you're gonna have a lot of procurements happening, but at the same time, you're gonna have delays in mm -hmm. deliveries, you know, basically you know, having you know, local funding to operate manage. drivers. There's a lot of, you know. And some of the projects are either gonna have to be moved out or um, scale down because of the escalating costs. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> no one. Well, we have our draft um, agenda here. Um, based on what we've heard, Kate, next steps. Well, as I say, so um, as we, the way we frame our legislative agenda is about policy topics. And so we do want to have a conversation about strategy and we're getting a little bit, you know, knowing our story, telling our successes, all those sorts of things. Um, and I, you know, take obviously to Alex and Amy, I do not sense that there's anything we need to fundamentally change, add, subtract, at least from the state, state side. But for there is something that DRPT has approached us, and I actually just was doing a little sidebar with some of our jurisdictions, I'm not saying, I don't think it's something that we would want to be the lead, but I think we want to be mindful. And I'm sorry, Amy, because I know we talked about this. If this is the, this is DRPT came to us. They weren't available, understandably. Um, but Amy, do you want to give a lowdown on what the state is interested in doing? I think I understand a little bit of it. But. <laughs> well, hopefully I understand. I probably understand just about as much as you, but um, I did have a good conversation with Jen DeBrule about it earlier this week. And so to me, what my understanding is that basically there is a conflict in Virginia law with federal law um, that is preventing um, the, the state from being able to allow localities to do transit bus procurements. Um, and so right now, I guess they had money that was, I think, allocated to be spent back in May and June, Kate, and um, they have actually not been able to go forward with any of those purchases um, or even opening up that procurement because of this conflict in the state and federal law. And so it's an issue with the Department of General Services who runs the procurement and DRPT have both identified this problem. And essentially what it is, is that our state law requires um, dealer licenses for bus transits. And then at the same time, the federal law that lets you use the federal funds, if you wanted to be able to sort of match some state funds and federal funds, it actually specifically prohibits those licenses from being required. So there's this inherent conflict between these two pieces of um, legislation is my understanding. And so, mm -hmm. Um, and so what's happening is that obviously, so this has been sort of, we're, we're in this sort of state of abeyance, I guess I would say since the spring. And so GRPT would like to figure out how to fix it. Um, and so um, obviously the easiest way to fix this problem is, um, is to put something in the caboose budget, right? So the caboose budget is the end, the last six months of the current budget cycle. And it's just language. So it's not money, it doesn't cost anything. It would just be um, a change to allow um, allow this to be able to proceed forward and, and to remove that that conflict with federal law. Um, so I have um, made an inquiry in with the Secretary of Finance's Deputy Secretary. Um, I talked to him this week. Um, he was going to check in with his folks um, on the budget staff to see. He had not heard of this issue before. I do believe that it was in the um, Secretary's transportation package. Like I do think the issue was in there. However, as you all know, when, when secretaries present a package, it usually has quite a few um, items in there. And this is obviously a small one, which is why we wanted to make sure it didn't get lost. I do think that we'll probably have to um, change the statute as well. Um, I do think it's one of those things where we could do that short-term fix because the caboose budget takes effect when the governor signs it. So that means it would be it would be in effect faster. And so that means like early on, like maybe in April, we'd be able to start this process and then we could put it in the other budget takes effect on July 1 or get a statute passed. So we, we would be able to have some, I think, some checks and balances to make sure that this process uh, would go forward. So we are investigating that right now. Um, like I said, I was working with, um, I talked to Jen about it just so I could get a better sense of what we needed to do. Um, and so that process is sort of in the works at the moment. Um, when I find out more information, we can figure out whether or not we need to get a bill drafted, but we probably will. Um, and again, it's, it's a technical change that would um, be able to kind of exempt transit bus, um, like people who make transit buses from requiring this dealer license. And so, um, so hopefully we can, um, we can move forward with that. But that's where we are right now on that issue. And I think, that, does that make sense? Or I know it's a little bit, it's a little bit in the weeds okay. for sure. So, Well, and I'll just add a little context. This actually did come up at the commission meeting when we were talking, when Alexandria was talking about DASH, the procurement issue. So Jennifer Mitchell actually briefly mentioned it. 
I think where the dynamic at play here is that um, school buses actually already have this exemption. So it's with the idea would be to add transit to this as well. As we look at, here we come off of talking about the federal, as we look at the potential for our localities to be trying to do things using federal money, right now they couldn't use the state procurement vehicle. So it's there. There is a conflict in that. Um, I would be interested in talking to Sarah, you know, at the city and other places. Um, we've already talked to the Virginia Transit Association. In some ways, I see this as something where we can be. I mean, obviously, we, we all support flexibility in procurement and procurement and being able to leverage federal money. Um, but I would like to see perhaps the Virginia Transit Association leading this because it's all the transit systems in Virginia. Um, and I was just approached, you know, just a couple of days ago on the topic, but I wanted to put that out there. It's very easy to add something in here, but strategically, I mean, Amy's been incredibly helpful, but I don't, I mean, I guess I get a sense from you is this is where, where we would be, you know, large and in charge from other localities. It's there, but it's not falling the sword there, mm -hmm. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I care, Amy, does that sound about right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we would certainly partner with them them on. I mean, I think that certainly makes sense. I mean, I think that's that that doesn't. Um, I mean, I think it's. I think it would be helpful for us to continue to be involved, especially during this transition. I think that would be. I mean, I think it's important to to make sure. And I think that's. I think it's one of the reasons DRPT came to us too, just because you know it, it, there is some question about staffing and who stays. And you know, obviously, you know, we're going to lose the secretary and the, and the two deputy secretaries of transportation. You know, probably right there in early January. So I think the issue is just making sure that there's somebody to help keep it through the process, especially if it's a budget process, as Senator Evan knows, I mean, that, that when it's language like that, language, it, it's because sometimes it's so small, sometimes it, that almost tends to get more lost, as you know. So it's like, you know, just try to kind of keep an eye on it. Um, and so I think that's something that we can we can work with Senator Evan on um, as we go through that process, if, if he is willing, obviously, but um, it's something yeah, that I think is a little tricky. Yeah. So what I was to suggest is there are ways within the language we can talk about supporting, I mean, supporting legislation that allows our jur jurisdictions to leverage federal money, right? I mean, I think there's a nice broad statement that kind of captures this. Um, and so that's my proposal to be including something like that, not necessarily draw huge attention to it, but saying in general, you know, we would obviously want to allow our transit agencies to be maximize their flexibility in accessing all types of money um, and helping break down any barriers that may exist. Does that sound yeah. reasonable? Okay. And Kate, I was going to say, you might even be able to put it in the, the part where you talk about the um, the unallocated COVID relief funds, maybe, maybe just add, maybe broadening that um, that section to be federal funds and putting it, you know, maybe having the COVID piece underneath there, as well as making sure that we can get, um, you know, leverage any federal funds. Maybe you can just do it together in that section. That might be the best. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, just sort of broadening okay. that, um, you know, just broadening, because COVID money is federal money, too. So maybe you can kind of just figure out how to broaden that a little bit and put it in that category. That might be the best place to plug it in. Was okay. when, I, when I was looking through it, I thought that might be the best place to put it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so that said, um, again, the, um, the contents of the agenda itself for the, the state space um hoping that the committee is comfortable with what we have again we always try to make it a broad enough umbrella to respond because we all know once the general assembly gets going sometimes catching up <laughs> with what's happening in real time um again the the focus very much is preservation preservation gas tax right i mean there that's already embedded in here is ensuring that the good strides that were made in the last five years when it comes to shoring up transportation funding are not affected. Um, I know the question has come up at our commission meeting, um, the language about restoring funding to the authority that we've been working with Tracy Boehner on that. So I just want to say that that's, I mean, we are in sync absolutely with the authority um, on those things. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, comments, or concerns about the content um, or talking a little bit more, more about strategy. I mean- Yeah, yeah I, I just please. had a question on the um, zero and low emission public transit. If it makes any sense to say that there are you know, lower costs to operate or, I mean, it's kind of- Yeah. Because I think- <laughs> you, so, to, op, to operate? Not- 
without the same fuel cost. It, so, it's it's it, it's a complicated. Okay. Yeah, I like, don't okay. want to put that Got sales it. job out of it. I mean, sure. there may be a life cycle cost. Sure. Um, okay. But I think what we've found is there actually are. We're still learning, right? Okay. So we're still learning that you may need to have one and a half buses basically for every one. Sure. So I want to be careful okay. um, not to that oversell. And then there's some technology uh, changes coming up that could also change that uh, uh, assessment mm -hmm. over the next five, six years. Okay. Yeah. Amy, Alex, anything from more on the strategy for our state mm -hmm. stuff? I mean, I think, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I would say the strategy, like I said before, when we were talking, I mean, I think a lot of it is going to be education. I mean, obviously educating a lot of the new delegates will be really important, um, as well as the transition, um, the tr transition team for Governor-elect Youngkin. I mean, I think one of the things that Alex and I have been trying to stay on top of is whether or not they're going to have a similar transition structure to what Governor Northam had. It's, it's a little bit unclear right now whether they're going to kind of put together, you know, sort of big teams that are going to come up with policy ideas like they did Um that both Kate and you know Doug from BRE served on, as well as I did um, during the Governor uh, Northman's transition. We're not sure if they're going to do that, to be honest with you. But if there are opportunities um, for expertise, we will. We are certainly trying to keep an eye on that to be able to, um, you know, have Kate be on there, um, folks from BRE and, and folks from Metro to kind of like we're we're staying on. We're trying to stay on top of that to make sure that there's an opportunity for the Northern Virginia transit and and rail expertise to 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 be put forward. So that's that's one of the main things that we're doing. Um, which I think will be important. Um, and then, you know, for, from another standpoint, I mean, I think, you know, the other idea is that once we start, like I said, we're paying attention to who's going to be committee chairs and, and, and what we're looking for, you know, it's very likely that um, Delegate Terry Austin will be the um, chair of transportation in the House. And he is um, from sort of the western part of Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley area, um, not too far actually from uh, from speaker elect Todd Gilbert, but um, but he's he's been a really big help with Northern Virginia transportation issues, which I know is probably sounds a little surprising being from the Western part of the state, but he um, he really does understand the importance and the difference of all the different transportation needs across the state, which I think is gonna be really helpful for us. So once that gets named, I think, you know, Alex and I would work with him to set up meetings um, so that we can, we can meet him, he can get to know you guys. Um, and I think it'll be really an important thing to do. So we're, you know, those are the types of things that we're really trying to stay on top of. Um, and again, I think just working with Kate and the staff to come up with some, um, some materials that we can talk about, you know, staying the course and, and just educating them about what, what was already, what we're already doing and why, why we don't think we should change. Um, and you know, we'll be working with VRE to do the same thing on, tran on transforming rail. Um, and I suspect that Greg um, will be doing the same thing with, with Metro as well. So I think that the goal is to kind of continue to work with all of our allies and try to do our best on educating um, all the folks about transportation in Northern Virginia. Um, I'm trying to see if I let anything off. Obviously, we're in good shape too. I mean, I think the other thing is that we have to remember, and you know, Senator Evans here and, and can and speak to this. You know, that the the leadership did not change in the Senate, um, and so you know, their knowledge and their appreciation for all that all the work that we've been doing in Northern Virginia continues. And you know, they'll be a really good um, help for us to be able to kind of create that back, backstop and also just be able to kind of talk to folks and provide that education opportunity. So, um, I mean, I think those that. You know, we've been here before, you know, we, you know, we, we worked really well with the um, uh, Republican General Assembly in the past, um, Republican House, especially you know, we, in 2018, we passed our big, huge Metro bill. And that was when the House was controlled by Republicans. So, um, you know, I, I think we'll just do our best to continue to educate people. And I, I think we're going to, I think we're going to be okay. Okay. <laughs> Two things occur to me in, in general. Um, one is that Senator Eben and I, back in the before times, were talking about that tour. So maybe that's something to think about again. Maybe I know, you know, I know it's a whole lot of work, but depending on what you know, we need to find out, um, Alex find out, that might be something to consider. Mm -hmm. And then two, it seems to me our overall strategy is should be keeping. Let's keep transportation boring. I mean, we're we're not controversial right now. <laughs> I think we need to keep it that way, just for a while. So that's 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 sort of well the said. strategy. <laughs> well, well, well said. Uh, yeah, and 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 I second the the, uh, the notion that maybe next summer we should try and do a transit tour for some, whether it's the Joint Commission on Transportation Accountability or the House and Senate Transportation Committees or the Chairman or some folks to show them what we've got going on up here. I think it might be helpful. Yep. 
will be up to it. Yeah, it wasn't really conducive to the uh, collective tour. No, so. there, there are a number of things that yeah, all yeah. of a sudden are coming back to us. Absolutely. And, and actually, if I could do do a, a little bit of a plug, we actually do have a new communications professional that has joined NVTC Money Driver. And so uh, talk about telling the story. One of the things that we were since we actually snagged over from VDOT um, is really telling the success stories, right? And so as we look to communicating, you know, and 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 have what I refer to as the leave behind or the other, you know, sort of things Monique's going to be helping us with. A lot of those, um, there are a lot of really fantastic stories to talk about what's been invested in public transit um, in the last you know, three years since the omnibus bill. And so we can help tell that story. So. Well, what? I don't know that those stories could be boring. <laughs> you know what I mean. I mean, I you know, but Not nothing to see here. <laughs> it's all good. It might be feel good. Yeah. Nothing to worry about here. That's right. So let, let, let me add one more thing. I think it's a challenge about what transit is really doing. What is the performance? The ridership is at 10% and we're funding it at near 2019 levels. We better figure out how to explain that in ways that are uh, understandable. Because someone may look at the shift. The highways are pretty much back to where they were in 2019, mm -hmm. if not higher. So if you want to you want to invest in transportation, where do you put your money? Put it on highways as opposed to transit right. that very few people are riding. So we're going to need to mm -hmm. continue to focus on performance in terms of bringing riders back. Mm -hmm. um, because at some point in this grand debate, somebody's going to say, well, we're pumping more money into this, and who's being certified? So. Absolutely. I may just add one thing. On, on the federal uh, formula side, we're basically frozen in 2019 national transit database numbers. So we're getting the formulas being paid out based on 2019 numbers until I think it's 2023. Um, so formula wise, we're, we're safe for a little bit. Um, uh, but again, uh, of course, as you, as you mentioned, you're trying to justify. On the supplemental appropriation side, giving more money to transit, um, especially when transit received, I believe it's just under seventy billion dollars in COVID relief, in addition to the ninety-one point three billion dollars mm -hmm. from the infrastructure bill. And so, the, the the talking point has been, well, the seventy billion was just to maintain, and the ninety-one point two was to build. And so, um, as was mentioned at NAFTA and elsewhere, um, the transit meeting to justify and, and show um, show results from the federal investment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So on the federal side, um, and now that we're unpacking the law, we actually have the ability to add a little bit more of a preface in the in the beginning of the federal priorities. But as I mentioned before, and, and Ben and I have been talking a lot about is um, is how those programs are rolled out. And if um, our localities want to participate, finding ways in, to minimize any additional strings that FTA may add to it that are not existing in law. So I know that some of our localities, I think the Lee Fairfax and Arlington, Alexandria, um, have actually over the years, and Falls Church have over the years applied and got federal grants um there are strings attached with those grants um and so what we're trying to understand is there's some strings that are put in the code in the law okay and that's fine but finding that it's not that the the um u.s department of transportation then adds something above and beyond so i think that um positioned in a really good way this is i think where there's some opportunities as i know a lot of the um the staff civil service folks over at the Federal Transit Administration over the U.S. Department of Transportation is, is really working to make sure that they're not adding something that is sort of unnecessary for the scope of what's being asked. So for example, if, if one of the localities applies and gets a planning grant for transit-oriented development, those things actually are exist, they're actually in the law, they're something we wanna look at, 
does it all of a sudden mean that they have so much burden that you have to hire you know three full-time people just to manage a one little grade? So that's what we're trying to understand. I don't have the answers, but what we're asking the questions, right? Um, likewise, um, we talked a lot about the zero emission space last week. Um, in the way that the Federal Transit Administration rolls out that program, is there value or not to be doing a regional application and administration versus an individual locality? I don't know what the answer is to that yet, but those are the sort of things that we're thinking through. Because um, again, this is an unprecedented level of funding. If Northern Virginia localities would like to play in it, we want to make, make sure that there's a way that they can do that with eyes open as to what that means. And I think many of our localities know exactly what that means to be part of the federal space. I'm sort of turning back to my Fairfax County colleagues. It is not insignificant. That doesn't mean there may be a bang for the buck, right? Or juice for the squeeze. That's something that we'd like to be able to help the localities figure out. Um, because we've got a little bit of time before the next round with the appropriations of funding but we don't have a ton of time if, again, the localities want to play in that space. So that is really very much the focus of what we have here. The, um, the question maybe I have back for Bennett, maybe this is not the year, but maybe next year. One of the things I was hearing loud and clear at the APTA conference was the funding mechanisms to shore up the trust fund, that's the highway trust fund that transit comes out of, is not sustainable. Um, it's actually, they basically cleaned out all the couch cushions um, and, and short it up for this five-year period of time. So there is a fiscal cliff, just like we short up the state trust fund a year and a half ago, I believe that there's going to be a need to be shoring up the highway trust fund at the end of this authorization, which is five years. So we have a little bit of time, but do you want to add right, to that? And, and typically it's just transfers from the general fund from treasury. To, um, and so because um, increasing the federal gas tax is a non-starter. I believe we we'll, may not be able because if we couldn't get it done at this point, I just don't know at what point in time we could. Um, you know, there, there's very few uh, solutions that we have other than relying on the federal fund for immediate transfers. Yeah. Um, so again, um, we had historically a shoring up of the trust fund. It's very easy to add that back in here to the federal. That's a, sort of a longer, a longer term um, vision, but that is definitely obviously insofar that we've got a number of local or a number of our transit systems that do use the federal money. We want to make sure that's short up in the long term. So it's good to put that there. Okay. So maybe the past five years was and all well in, in the congressional you space you actually need that many, you know, that's true. they're already going to start thinking about that. Um and two years we'll start on the next year authorization. Yeah, yep. next year authorization. So um, five years is two years. So we had that previously I'll pop back I do want to clar clarify um, the other three things that we have, um, in particular, um, the transit benefits. There's absolutely no threat to the transit benefits at this moment in time. Um, we know that that's actually very important, especially as our federal workforce comes back. Um, so I just want to be very clear. There, there's nothing that's saying it's going away, um, but some of the tea leaves are, you know, if you look to, if you're trying to cut something in a major tax bill in the future, Having that in there sort of protects that. Is that right? Um, the continued support for COVID-19 relief, I actually did hear a little bit more this past week. Um, there is actually a bill working through the House and Senate right now, um, which may not be applicable to our, our um, localities and, and cities, but for those transit systems that get the formula money, WMATA, VRE, or what have you, um, if they are still in need, they can, a locality, this is the law would allow the locality to use unallocated COVID relief funds for public transit purposes. So the pot that your own localities have, currently that is not an eligible expense, um, but it is literally only eligible. It's not like it's eligible for your own personal public transportation. It's only, would, the law would only change it to be eligible for the FTA, um, like, you know, for for WMATA or what have you. So I guess we'll we'll follow that. Um, but I, I don't see a direct nexus um, to the cities and counties, right? Am I? Yeah, the, the it's, it stipulates uh, broadband sewer and water infrastructure are, are currently eligible. And so what this does, 
that Misty mentioned, it opens it up to a number of the transit programs under FTA, bus bus facilities, capital investment grant, CMAC, SDUG, all those. Um, it, it, it passed the Senate, it is in the House now. Um, you know, you know, US Congress and mayors, national media cities are, are making the advocacy push to, to see that that gets passed. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the last one we have here is, again, a placeholder that I think would be a um, very long term outlook is what I mentioned the federal program is a capital program. Um, it would be a huge, I mean, during COVID, all that funding was from the relief packages were eligible for transit operations. We all know that's been shoring up and um, keeping any layoffs from happening for all of the transit systems. This is, do we start exploring the federal space for transit operations um, in particular, you know, when we look at things like, like Metro, this is a very, very big lift. I actually did not hear many people talking about this at APTA. So, you know, we can keep it in here. I don't know if there's a an appetite at the federal space to be exploring it, but I, I think I've heard from you over the months and years that we don't want to, but we'd like to make at least make that statement that eligibility of transit operations is something that we might be interested in, especially to help, you know, WMATA um, and PRB. Okay. No, I, I guess yeah. my other question to that kid would be capacity wise, how are you going to feel about it? Because considering what we're going into next year, is that is there something that we have on the plate as well? Or? So tell me a little bit more about what you mean by capacity, just so I make sure. Capacity for you to be able to add that to. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, this, yeah, our ability, I mean, our honestly, in, in many of the federal space, our effectiveness in lobbying for these major things is because we're working with Yuri Wamada, like in whole big concert, right? Um, and uh, and so, yeah. I mean, I don't. I mean, this and again, this could be somewhat of a marker. Sometimes what we get is is the American Public Transportation Association and others say, "Hey, can you sign on this letter?" So that, yeah, doing a major lobbying, we do not have the capacity at all um, in house to be doing that. Adding on to others who may be voicing that is is likely where we would sign on letters, sign on letters right? And so that would allow me to sign on letters, right? right. So. Just, just so no, I appreciate that. Yeah. And all those other places in the world where they did the right job of transit, do they have operators that do their federal governments and national governments support the operators? I'm just curious. I think they do. Well, there's a very different tax structure. Right. So a lot of the state supported, it, I mean, I don't know if it, whether it's federal, federal versus state versus local, I think is a little, depends on what country, but the, um, just the, you know, just think about gas taxes. There's a lot, there's a tax infrastructure that's supporting services like public transit in a way, like, I know you're probably thinking about Europe or what have you, very, very different than the U.S. It's just a, right, right. I'm just guessing that we should be actually not doing it very well. We also have uh, less, I think I had a question, less, uh, you know, possibly lower environmental standards. Yeah. Or, you know, just, nice just the, yeah, the, the, the regulatory process is a little bit more friendly. Yeah. So in summary, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be tying this in a bow, you know, tightening it up okay. uh, and having this presented to the commission at our December meeting. Likewise, we'll have the um, the VRE, which is basically mirrors. This just gets a little bit um, more focused on some of the rail issues, um, and um, and then it's really, I mean, all the marketing. It's telling the story. We do have our legislative event on Monday, December six, down at Springfield. Um, I'm still trying to secure somebody from the administration to speak, um, and I'm. I, it will be successful. I just can't tell you who it is right now. I've, I'm, I'm kind of going down the, the chain and across and what have you. We do have Secretary Valentine and or Nick Donahue coming somewhat to give a little bit of their, you know, I guess tribute to the successes that they've had um, after, after the last, you know, four, eight years. You say the administration, you mean the federal administration? The federal administration. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just came from a federally focused conference. So my mind yeah. is very much, so we had, we had actually reached out to, um, uh, to Deputy Secretary Polly Trottenberg, um, and I'm now working with Under Undersecretary for Policy, um, Carlos Monier, and I may go to FTA, but I actually thought, considering 
your locality's interest in both the highway and the transit, I thought it'd be really nice to have somebody from the secretary's office. So I'm still working some of that. It may be somebody from Federal Transit Administration. I'll get, we're going to get somebody, I promise you. Um, and then, of course, we do have Paul Wiedefeld, Rich Dalton, and Bob Schneider talking about, you know, obviously the, the transit priorities for their localities. Um, and it is an in-person event um, in a nice big high conference room. Um, so I think it'll be nice for colleagues to get together. So, yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah. Okay. Well, that seeing other, first I wanna thank Amy and uh, Alex for joining us remotely and Bennett for being here as well. Yeah. And we will um, see you all at the next commission meeting. Absolutely. And again, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful to the Palmo Strategies team and then to Bennett as well, because um, they really are helping us kind of watch all this stuff that moves really fast and furious. Um, so thank you. Okay. Right. Happy to. Thank you for having okay. us. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Have a great weekend. So we can end the broadcast.